Let's get Norman again. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Sorry, so you've seen this helmet, uh, link below. It's uh, from the Night Shop. They've kindly sponsored this video with uh, these helmets. In fact, they've sent me a couple, which I've spoken about in that video before, but check out the link below if you're interested in these. They're really, really cool. Um, and uh, that I have spoken about Norman helmets before, uh, which it seems that some of you are quite interested in, and uh, a couple of things have come out um, of that video which I wanted to talk more about. Now the first thing I want to mention is my good friend um, Augusto, um, who is an Italian armourer, currently living somewhere in, I think, Germany, um, and so he makes armour. He's a, Any of you who are on the 14th or 15th century armour pages on Facebook will know Augusto. He does lots of really, really good research. I've mentioned him lots of times on this channel. He's been on this channel. He's the little Italian guy who nods a lot um, and he gets angry about armour but he knows loads of stuff. And uh, so he messaged me after watching the video and he, uh, he comes, he goes, he's writing. I was going to go, hey uh, Matt, ciao Matt. And I was going to do an Italian accent but I won't because he was writing. So it was me reading in my head in an English accent. He goes, hey Matt, you know the problem with that helmet is you're wearing it too low. And uh, I kind of know this, okay, so I didn't adjust this helmet. Let's put the shield down. I didn't adjust this helmet, I just slapped it on and made a video. Um, but indeed, this might look, uh, this might look aggressive and badass in a video, uh, but it is in fact sitting a bit too low on my head. Um, but that is easily remedied, and I'll show you how in a second. Uh, the point that Augusto made is that the um, the brow here really should be sitting up here so you can just about see my eyebrows um, and that is of course correct. Um, now if I take this helmet off as promised I said it's easy to adjust you'll see inside there this is what the inside of uh, lots of medieval helmets more or less look like actually you'll see that this is padded um, and I'll talk more about that that's the second part of this video um, but you'll see that there's a thong here now if I uh, do up that thong, this is a, a thong as in a leather strip, not a budgie smuggler. Um, if I tighten that up, um, then clearly it will sit slightly higher on my head. Um, and now this is fascinating, and this is why it's good to be mates with an armourer, uh, because they spend, you know, armourers, it's well known, armourers don't have social lives, they just spend the whole time mostly hunched over a computer or hunched over an anvil, uh, either making armour or looking at pictures of armour. They're pretty much obsessed with it, and anyone who becomes an armourer for a job is usually pretty damn obsessed with armour. But one of the great things is for those of us who are also interested in armour, we get to uh, glean little nuggets of information, uh, like tiny little details that we wouldn't necessarily notice. Uh, and one of those things that I had never noticed, I mean I've spent years, decades in fact, because I'm that old now, uh, I've spent years looking at historical manuscripts and artwork and I'd never noticed before that if indeed, if you look at historical artwork from the uh, you know, early medieval period through to the, the early Norman period, these types of helmets, whether they have a nasal or not, in art, they usually sit in such a way so that you can see the person's eyebrows. And that is a fascinating little detail I'd frankly never even noticed before. But it makes a certain amount of sense when you think about it, because if, you, if the helmet sits too low here, literally, although it might look like I've got great visibility, I can't see from there upwards, okay, in fact there. That is where my sight um, starts. Now if something's descending towards me, it could be a descending strike like a sword or an axe or a spear thrust uh, given over the top of a shield, or if it's something flying through the air like a rock or a, a hurled axe or a, you know, a spear or an arrow or whatever, <laughs> Harold Godwinson here, uh, then indeed I can't see it coming. Now you might say, ah, oh, but Matt, but that adds extra protection. That's true, but as I always try and point out with armour, it's about trade-offs, and this type of helmet, you've got to accept a lot of your face is exposed to some extent. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, again, because that's the second part of this video. Um, but the fact is that visibility is, is also a defence, and being able to see an attack coming in and stick your shield in the way or move out of the way or do whatever is, is a good thing. So sometimes giving up a bit of material protection for more visibility or ability to talk or breathe or whatever is a good thing, as I've spoken about many times in the past. Now, in terms of the um, the ride height, as it were. One of the reasons I didn't adjust it and one of the reasons I didn't mind that it sat too low is because I'm fully aware that this type of helmet, as some of you commented under my previous video, usually goes over a male 
commonly in the model world known as chainmail, a mail um, hood of some sort. I'm reluctant to call it a coif, although coif is probably the proper word. I think when most people think of a coif, they think of a, a, a male garment that is separate from the male shirt. And it does seem that at least in the time of the Battle of Hastings, at least if we trust the Bayer Tapestry and various other contemporary um, art sources, that the male hood was actually part of the, the hauberk of the, of the shirt. Um, so it does seem that the conventional male armour at the time of the Battle of Hastings, at least for the most well-equipped people, was a long male hauberk that came down pretty much to the knees with long sleeves, and a built-in hood as well and it does seem like they had some sort of flap element here if we look at later male shirts we do indeed that indeed see that the the uh, the coif element kind of closes around here so to cut a long story short you would have something maybe even uh, probably in fact definitely i would say some sort of arming cap underneath the mail because mail onto your bare head even if you've got hair unlike me even if you've got hair mail would be really unpleasant straight onto your head you need something underneath it some even even, even if it's just a felt or woolen cap of some sort um, so you'd have that some form of cap, then you'd have mail, then you'd have uh, the helmet over the top. So that would mean that it would naturally ride a bit higher anyway. I said this to Augusto, he said, yeah, absolutely, he said, but not everybody had that. And that's also a very good point, is that some people, as we see in the Bayer Tapestry, some people weren't well armoured, um, and some people, you know, the fear, in Anglo-Saxon system, the, there was the select feared, the professional warriors, and then the, the great feared, the essentially levied troops. And levied troops could hope to have a helmet, but they probably wouldn't have a male shirt most of the time. And they, even if they did have a male shirt, it might be the type which doesn't go over the head, doesn't have a hood. Uh, it might be an old, might be 100, 200 year old male shirt that's been in the family for generations and it doesn't have the added hood. So indeed, some soldiers would put this onto their bare heads or with a cap, and so they would need to adjust that. But it's easily adjustable, so one helmet can serve both. If you've got a male hood or a padded cap underneath, indeed you can put that uh, with a, a bit loosened over the top, or you can tighten it up and put it onto your bare head like I'm doing at the moment. Now the second thing, the second part of this video, connects to this, and it's about protectiveness of these. So quite a few people asked, how well did these actually protect from strikes? Uh, and they also asked about the sides of the face, couldn't you, shouldn't you have, wouldn't it be better to have cheek pieces, blah blah blah. Well, the male hood. So there we, these two things are connected and that's why I'm putting them into one video. The fact is that armor, as I say always, armor is always a trade-off. Yes, you could put yourself in a, in a giant tin can and nothing would be able to hit you, but you wouldn't be able to do anything. You wouldn't be able to hear, see, breathe, hit anyone, ride a horse, get off a horse, all of this kind of stuff. The fact is that armor is always a trade-off. And whenever you give up some degree of protectiveness for some other quality such as mobility, uh, the ability to see better or hear better or talk more easily to your troops, this kind of stuff, that's a trade-off, okay? And it's true with these helmets as with anything else. Now, these are quite a good balance of protectiveness versus strikes downwards, but they do seem exposed here. But when you consider that you're wearing a male hood or coif, that means now that this part of your head all around the sides and the back, and some of these in the earlier Viking era, some of these do actually have a, a male skirt. If you look at the Valsgard helmets, in fact, if you go before the Viking era and you go to Sutton Hoo um, and uh, Benty Grange and various other helmets from the kind of earlier, early medieval period, the so-called Dark Ages, the Migration era, you do in fact find some of them have permanently attached elements of mail or plates to the back and sometimes sides, sometimes cheek pieces as well. But in the Norman era, this type of helmet didn't need those because you had the male hood. And actually the male hood's a better solution because the male hood means you can take your helmet off and you're still wearing a male hood, you've still got that protection around here and you can sit your helmet back on again uh, and it goes cleanly and easily over the male hood and it's all one piece with the hauberk. So it's a nice clean solution that gives a lot of protection here. Male it's true, it doesn't give a huge amount of impact protection, but it gives a lot of cut and thrust protection. It's quite difficult to get through historically made accurate mail. It's very, very effective stuff. Now, in terms of being hit on the head with one of these, 
This is a complicated topic, but basically these do offer very good protection. You can put extra padding in them. Now this one, I have a relatively small, I've got something like a 57 or 58 head, and this is a medium size, but there is some movement in here. If I was doing reenactment, for example, what I would do is I would um, either wear a cap, bear in mind I don't have hair as well, and that's a big part of this. People in this period, you've seen their pudding bowl haircuts that the Normans had. Uh, so, well, that's later plantations, but the Normans had certainly hair around the front. Um, if you've got plenty of hair, that fills up as void in here, which with a bald person that doesn't happen. We would need to wear a cap, basically. But what you can do as well is actually put a sort of rim of padding around the edge, and that gives great impact protection and prevents the helmet from slamming into your head when it's hit from the side. From the top, it's not really a problem. I can smash this pretty damn hard because you've got that web inside preventing it coming into contact with your head but from the sides indeed I would not want to be hit very hard in the side of the head without having uh, some kind of padded cap or putting a line of padding around the edge of here because I don't have hair as natural padding and incidentally uh, lots of padding uh, and cushioning in this period inside it it didn't have foam foam didn't exist it had hair it had horse hair and horse hair was as as far as i'm aware pretty much one of the most uh, popular as well as certain types of flax and wool of course uh, but natural hairy fibers were the natural type of padding so ha like hair and if you've got plenty of hair you don't necessarily need it but i don't as you can see um so the male coif great uh uh, and uh, if you have imp uh, that will fill out that space as well that would achieve the same thing so you can put a bit more padding inside these things uh, but you if you have the male coif uh, with any kind of cap underneath you probably don't need it um, so there we go they are when worn correctly with the correct equipment fantastic head protection and they are a very good balance of protection versus mobility visibility and everything else so thank you very much for um for the people that commented underneath my last video thank you to augusto for um pointing out the uh, his eyebrows to me fascinating things they were and also thank you very much obviously to the night shop for sending me these these will be featured in loads of videos because they're such a long-standing type of helmet um, and very very and these are really nice i'm constantly surprised for the money how really nicely made these are uh, they're really cool things nice shape to them right so uh, thanks for watching give us a like and a subscribe please um, and i will see you really soon on this channel again uh, if you're wondering what jacket i'm wearing this is from spez it's a new hema um, sparring jacket i'll talk about this in a future review but uh, yeah share the video See you again soon. Take care, folks. All the best. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.